has advised the current she has advised the current U.S. administration and is a term member on the Council on Foreign Relations. And even in addition uh, to open our program with perspective and joining us from uh, Vilnius, Lithuania, uh, where Svetlana also is, I welcome the U.S. Ambassador to Belarus, Julie Fisher, a career foreign, senior foreign service officer. And in addition to her current and many other postings, she has served in executive positions with NATO in the State Department's 24-7 Operations Center at U.S. embassies in Georgia, Ukraine, and Russia, and on the National Security Council. She is fluent in Russian and French. So with that, Ambassador Fisher, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Rick. I'm sorry, my computer is a little bit slow, but um, can you hear me okay? Can I confirm that? Yes. Super, super. Well, thanks very much. Um, it, it's really, it's a real pleasure for me to be able to join you from so many time zones away um, to talk about Belarus and to talk about what is happening um, and to, to join, of course, Madam Sikhanouskaya for this discussion. Um, I thought I might spend a few minutes on the sort of uh, how did we get to this point um, with regards to Belarus and why is it that after 27 years of Alexander Lukashenko's uh, rule that Belarus has found itself in this position? And I think without uh, sort of uh, turning this into a, a history lecture, I think what I would really focus on is exactly what it is that Lukashenko has done to Belarus that I think is so important to understanding what is happening today. Um, he has been running a uh, Soviet, a post-Soviet experiment um, in Belarus all of these 27 years, trying to retain many of the features of the Soviet Union, even after Belarus's independence. And um, after all of these years of his mismanagement of the economy and his mismanagement um, of the government uh, in Belarus, um, you know, we saw the elections in 2020 where the people of Belarus said, uh, we, we want something new and we want something different. His inability fundamentally to accept uh, political competition, political opposition, to hear the voices of dissent inside Belarus led him first to arrest um, uh, his competition, namely the husband of Svetlana uh, Siarhe Sikhanouski uh, and other candidates that were competing for the presidency. Uh, he jailed them and then he conducted an election that wasn't sort of fraudulent on the margins. It wasn't as if a few things didn't go according to normal order. It was an election that was comical in its conduct. It was an election that was evident to all of the people of Belarus just how hard it was that Lukashenko had to work to falsify the votes in order to suggest that he in fact won rather than uh, Svetlana. So when the people of Belarus saw that and they understood it, that's when they decided to take to the streets. And we were witness to hundreds of thousands of Belarusians turning out in support of Svetlana and in support of democracy and the rule of law. The violence and the repression that followed has been well documented. Um, that violence and repression has led to more than a thousand political prisoners being held today. Uh, it led Lukashenko to uh, bring down a civilian airliner for the purpose of arresting an opposition blogger. Uh, it led him to, to weaponize, to instrumentalize migrants against his neighbors in Poland and in Lithuania. Um, and with every each of these steps, Lukashenko has moved himself further and further from the, the sort of mainstream international consensus. And every step away from the West has made him more dependent on and increasingly vulnerable to the Kremlin. And what we see today is that Lukashenko has become sort of the model neighbor for somebody like Vladimir Putin. He is corrupt, he is dependent, he is malleable, uh, and that is what, in this moment of crisis, as we see what Putin is doing uh, to Ukraine, as we see this war 
that he has brought to Ukraine. This is what he wants to make of his neighbors. And Lukashenko shows us that, I think, every single day. So he's been clinging to power. Um, and as a result of that desperate effort, he decided he would hold a referendum uh, last Sunday in order to change the constitution to create a second job for himself, to remove Belarus's traditional commitment to neutrality and to non its non-nuclear status. Um, and, you know, these steps are so distant, they're so far removed from again, that, that consensus that is built inside Belarus and what it is that the people of Belarus are looking for. And I think we have to ask ourselves, so who is going to, if, if he is so far apart from the people of Belarus, who is going to, um, who is going to stand in Lukashenko's way? Who is it that prevents him from taking Belarus in this direction? And first and foremost, the answer to that question in my mind is somebody who is with us tonight. It's, it's Madame Sik. And it is the democratic movement that she leads. They are the ones who speak for the people of Belarus in this moment. They are the voice of the people uh, as, as they seek to have in this moment of crisis, as they seek to have their voices heard. And uh, as you noted, Rick, Svetlana is in Vilnius, which is where I am. But this movement that she leads, they are in, they are in Warsaw and there are many have been in Ukraine and are in the process of leaving. There are many in Georgia. They are uh, in other capitals in Europe. There are there are Belarusians in the United States, and it is an enormous challenge to think about leading a movement of this type. And it's not just those who are in exile. It is also those who are inside Belarus. It is those who are behind bars as political prisoners. It is those who are brave enough. Uh, in ways big and small to express their opposition to Lukashenko um, and those who make choices every single day, whether they are going to move towards the light and the future and democracy and the rule of law, or whether they are going to support the forces of darkness and the forces of the past. I think we in the international community have an important role to play in supporting this movement, just as the United States and uh, our allies in Europe supported uh, Poland's solidarity movement in the 80s. It is our responsibility to support this one now, which is why discussions like this are so important, uh, so important to help um, build an understanding of what it is that is necessary to confront what is needed from Americans, not just uh, not just from those of us who are diplomats, but from the United States of America in a moment like this. And it's not just us doing this alone. Let me be really clear about that. We are working every single day. I work every single day uh, with diplomats from uh, Poland and Lithuania and Latvia and the European Union. Uh, so many others, um, our, our British counterparts, Canadian counterparts, and others who are also invested in the cause of freedom and uh, supporting this fight, again, that Svetlana is such a champion of, um, of uh, confronting authoritarianism. So um, there's so much that we can talk about, and I don't want to get in the way of the important remarks that we're going to hear from Svetlana. So uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to join you tonight. I'm so happy to, to be here with Melinda and with Svetlana and others. I'm really looking forward to hearing everyone's remarks. And Melinda, why don't I turn it back over to you? Terrific, thank you, Julie. Thank you for being part of the Forces of Light. Thank you for joining us. I'm grateful for everything you're doing in Warsaw, in Vilnius and beyond. Uh, hello, Svetlana, it's wonderful to see you. It's been many months since I've seen you. Thank you so much for making time to talk to your friends in America. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dame Linda. Thank you, Dame Ambassador Fisher, for uh, this update of the situation, the organizers and um, their friends. You know, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to the World Affairs Council. And it's my pleasure to join you here today to discuss the situation. It's such a crucial hour for all of us. There is no question that uh, this is a historic time. The future of Europe, not just that of Ukraine and Belarus, is being decided right now. Uh, 
We are now uh, witnessing perhaps the biggest military conflict on the continent since World War II. And it's hard to imagine that in 2022, people in the center of Europe will have to hide in subways uh, awaiting bombardment or stand in front of tanks uh, on the road to, to stop them. But this war resulted from the lessons of the past that we never learned. And the most important of them, that dictators cannot be re-educated or appeased. The Russian war against Ukraine is an like, essential test for Europe. Is it capable of protecting its core values or will it allow Russia to abuse neighbors uh, without consequences? And it's a pity, but Belarus' role in this assault is evident. Lukashenko's regime provided Belarusian territory for this assault. And Ukrainian cities are shelled from Belarus every night. And moreover, Belarusian tanks with uh, like red squares on the side can uh, cross the Ukrainian border at any moment. And we know that Belarus military officers still resist. They don't want to drag our country into this conflict, but pressure from Kremlin and Lukashenko intensifies and uh, you know, actually they don't leave uh, them much of a choice. The current development changes in, uh, the, the current development changes the political landscape among the broader population. We know that Belarusians don't want their country to become a like pariah state uh, following the Kremlin's madness. The support um, for Belarus partnership with uh, Europe increases because in contrast to Russia, which is clearly uh, associated with war at the moment, Europe means safety and stability for Belarusians. And uh, this perception will remain for a very long time. Belarusians want peace, not war. And even before everything uh, started, only 11% of uh, Belarusians agreed that our soldiers uh, should be sent to Ukraine to support Russia. But this number might have decreased since then. On the other side, solid anti-war sentiment is rising. Therefore, uh, on Sunday, we launched a campaign of peaceful disobedience, disobedience and uh, resistance to protest against uh, the Russian assault on Ukraine and against the presence of Russian troops uh, on our territory. On Sunday, dozens of thousands took to the streets in Minsk and uh, other cities uh, carrying uh, Belarusian and Ukrainian flags. And even at the risk of arrest, we know that more than 800 uh, people were detained. They still found courage um, uh, to make their voices heard despite one and a half year of uh, total repressions in Belarus. And these were the biggest demonstrations in Belarus in, in, in one and a half year since uh, 2020. We are also seeing active resistance uh, in Belarus on many levels. Uh, cyber partisans blocking the roads and uh, disrupting the railway system to stop transport with uh, military vehicles. A few days ago, the train with food for Russian soldiers was delayed by uh, almost five hours because of a uh, cyber partisans attack. And Russian troops in Belarus already feel that they are not welcome here. And uh, let's not forget that repressions haven't stopped in Belarus for the last two years, as I have said already, since uh, 2020, more than 50,000 people have gone through detention. We have more than 1,000 political prisoners in Belarus, and some of them, uh, like my husband, are facing decades in prison for daring to speak about freedom. Almost all alternative voices are either in prison, in exile, or just afraid and like silently observing. And let me also uh, speak about uh, the shameful so-called referendum on the new constitution, which happened last Sunday. We all agree that it was a farce, so I propose not, not even discussing the numbers, uh, the outcome of this um, uh, shameful uh, referendum. But the most important, uh, it opened the gate to a, a very dangerous development. The new constitution removes a nuclear free status uh, of the country and its aspirations for neutrality. With Russia guns on our streets, the dictator removed the last 
obstacles in our constitution that could have prevented him from joining the attack on Ukraine and uh, putting nuclear weapons on our land to threaten Europe. Our independence and security of the entire Europe, I'd say, is at stake at the moment. And we can still stop Lukashenko and Putin, but we have to act bravely together. First of all, I call on the international community to impose the strongest possible sanctions on Lukashenko's regime and as soon as possible. Many things have been done in uh, the last few days. What is left? Uh, to ban Belarus state banks from using their SWIFT system. Otherwise, Belarus will become a loophole uh, for Russia to, uh, uh, to circumvent sanctions. Uh, second, I urge you to stop recognizing the authorities in Minsk is neither legitimate nor legal. The recognition is absolutely essential. The full responsibility for the war belongs to Lukashenko and uh, his regime, uh, al you know, along with the Russian president, of course. This is an act of um, treason or, and betrayal against our people. Uh, and uh, he sold our independence. He lost any right to speak uh, for Belarus. So don't talk to him, don't appease him. It's evident that Lukashenko has uh, lost control over Belarus military and has given up a, a big part of sovereignty already. So we ask you to consider defining Belarus as a country under occupation. I also ask you to support Belarusian media, journalists and bloggers, volunteers and uh, human rights defenders. Lukashenko and the Kremlin deliberately tried to destroy civil society to suppress uh, alternative voices. I ask you to support initiatives um, popularizing Belarus culture, language, and history, everything that strengthens uh, Belarusian national identity. We could see Ukraine as an example because they are invincible and demonstrate incredible resilience thanks to a united national identity. Last week, I announced my readiness to take responsibility to, uh, responsibility to represent the Republic of Belarus and the Belarusian people, and to create the United Transitional Cabinet, which will include people both from inside Belarus and the exile community, you know, to lead the country to democratic elections and independence. Uh, Lukashenko gave up this role and doesn't fulfill his duties as the defender of uh, uh, our independence anymore. Very soon, I plan to announce the details about this cabinet. We, uh, of course, we will be seeking support from the United States for it. Look, you can treat it as um, the government in exile. Uh, we didn't intend to do it before, but after Lukashenko gave up his duties, we didn't have any other choice. This is a historical chance for us. We see uh, growing pro-European moods among ordinary Belarusians. We will be asking the European Union to develop a, a formula for deeper partnership with Belarus, which will open the EU um, in perspective for our nation. Uh, I do not have an optimistic note uh, to end this speech. Um, the only optimism I can master right now is that maybe, possibly, perhaps, for once we will not repeat the mistakes of our past and we will not let aggression um, gain momentum because good people didn't do enough. No, not enough sanctions, not enough isolation of the dictators, not enough support for democracy. The power to stop uh, this gathering of evil is in our hands and we only have to use it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Svetlana. Those were really powerful remarks. I'd like to ask you a little bit more about the question of sovereignty. So you said that Russia put thousands of its troops in Belarus, and then they invaded Ukraine last week. They also, uh, they also invaded from Russia itself, but they, they did use uh, Belarus to, to move in. What does Putin's war mean for the sovereignty of Belarus? You said that the sovereignty is uh, it's it's basically gone, if I understood what you said. Could you say a little bit more about that? Has Putin completely gobbled up Belarus? Does he have, is he in charge at all? Or is, is it just, yes, sir, Mr. Putin, now? Uh, look, Belarus sovereignty is already undermined and uh, would be not mistake that 
we are under occupation. I, I often hear that Belarus is going to attack Ukraine, but is it Belarus uh, who takes decisions? Regime is taking orders uh, from Putin. Lukashenko lost its sovereignty, at least in decision-making. Our territory is being used for military aggression against Ukraine for more than a week and against the will of Belarus people. And it's uh, already clear that Lukashenko is losing control over armed uh, forces as well. Uh, the only thing he's still in control maybe is repressions uh, against uh, uh, Belarusians. Okay, so he has some domestic control, but in terms of foreign policy, Putin's in charge. Uh, obviously it is so. Okay, got it, got it. Okay, tell us what does Putin's me uh, move into Ukraine mean for the democratic movement of Belarus? Does it present any new opportunities for, for you beyond what you've described? Do, it, do, can you see uh, Lukashenko's authority and his support eroding now? Uh, Belarusians do see Russia as uh, the aggressor now, and uh, there are evident changes in moods uh, within Belarusian society, of course. More people have become more open uh, for integrating and collaborating with the European Union. Uh, for democratic movement, it's uh, also a chance to engage more people who maybe are less politicized, but who don't accept war. Uh, we have announced the launch of anti-war movement to mm -hmm. stop the war, help Ukrainian and return power to the people of Belarus. And we have seen the, as I said, the biggest protest on the streets mm -hmm. of Belarus since 2020. But I, I hopefully in this anti-war movement, more and more people will be involved. And in our plan uh, victory or the Peramoha, um, uh, a thousand of people joined uh, for last couple of days. That, that's really uh, wonderful to hear because before a week ago, uh, the democratic movement in Belarus was very, very quiet uh, and it was very dangerous for people to speak out, even to wear the, the color red. Uh, so it's really encouraging to hear uh, that, that the people are protesting and they're resisting. Can you tell us other ways that people are resisting? You said that they're slowing down trains, they're blocking roads. Are people making food and gathering medicine? What other kinds of resistance are people engaging in? Uh, so there are, of course, a lot of uh, direction uh, where people are working now. Uh, more people who dare to take active actions inside Belarus, uh, you know, they uh, try now to uh, stop military equipment through mm. uh, stop railway uh, railway uh, connection. Um, uh, people people in Belarus. Of course, very secretly, it's very dangerous. Try to um, spoil equipment that can help uh, um, uh, military movement uh, through Belarus. Uh, we are asking people uh, to for actions of disobe disobedience to mm -hmm. uh, this regime. A lot of IT specialists left uh, banks mm -hmm. recently. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, a lot of Belarusians went. Um, to Ukraine as volunteers to act mm -hmm. there uh, mm -hmm. to uh, you know provide some medical assistance uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know people are always needed mm -hmm. and uh, of course our media uh, open eyes to Belarusians who a lot of people in Belarus are still don't understand what's going on propaganda um, tr uh, tries a lot to um, show situation upside down that the Ukrainians are welcoming Russian tanks and, you know, people could believe this. And our very important task now to, uh, you know, to promote the real situation. And of course, uh, people who had to flee the country, um, who are mostly in uh, Poland now, they are um, assisting to uh, Ukrainian uh, people who are crossing border women and, and, and children. And it's also like a huge chunk of uh, assistance. We can't do really, can't do a lot uh, in Belarus at the moment. Mm -hmm. The same as Russians. Uh, and uh, But we really want to do our best to show Ukrainians that we are uh, not, not with Kremlin, we are with you. But of course, uh, for Ukrainians who are in the state of war, uh, it's, it's not enough. But yeah. look, we, we, are, we are doing our best. 
Svetlana, I just got back from Warsaw. I was there last week and I was touched by all of the ordinary Polish people I talked to. And they said, we've already helped the Belarusians and we're getting ready for the Ukrainians now. We're, we're raising money for groceries, for toothbrushes, for diapers. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's wonderful to see this outpouring of support for Ukrainians and, and for Belarusians. I'd like to ask you, uh, you were here in Washington a year ago, last summer, and Belarus was on the international stage. But unfortunately now, hardly anyone's paying attention to Belarus in the situation there. What can we do in Washington, in California, in New Jersey, everyone who's watching across America, what can we do to bring, to shine that light back on, on Belarus and on Lukashenko's evil deeds? Of course, it's uh, understandable that all the focus is uh, fixed up on Ukraine. Uh, but of course, uh, I have to say that Belarus' role uh, could be essential in ending uh, the war and solving the crisis because of its geographical and uh, political situation. Right now, Putin uses Belarus as proxy, and for him, mm -hmm. it's uh, the, the only ally right now. But what if we eliminate Lukashenko? Uh, will Putin uh, be same comfortable and uh, confident uh, in Ukraine? Uh, therefore, we ask to maximize sanctions on Lukashenko, to increase assistance for civil society, to, uh, but also to finalize the process of the recognition of Lukashenko. Don't talk to him, don't, uh, don't uh, give him legitimacy. Please realize that Ukraine and Belarus are two sides of the same problem. We are both victims of uh, Putin, like revanchist uh, dreams uh, of, uh, uh, of new empire. And now uh, when we see that uh, negotiations between Russia and Ukraine are going on on the territory of Belarus, Lukashenko maybe would like to be seen as a peacemaker, mm -hmm. you know, as, as a mediator, but he is not. He is responsible for, uh, he's also responsible for this war action on the territory of Belarus. Don't be, uh, don't let be fooled by, uh, by Lukashenko again. So you just spoke about uh, getting rid of Lukashenko. How long do you think he's going to be in power and beyond sanctions? Is there anything else that can be done to hasten his demise, to push him out faster? Uh, you know, when Lukashenko once was asked, are you going to stay in power forever? He answered, I have to consult with Kremlin. Uh, Lukashenko has uh, traded the independence of our country and he's, no, he's threat not only to our people, but also for all Europe. You know, he doesn't have support for the um, support of our people and his uh, choice, uh, or he, cho he choose like to hide behind guns and walls. The only reason why he is uh, there is Russian support. If um, uh, Kremlin uh, fails and Ukrainian wins, then Lukashenko will fall down immediately. I have talk, uh, told about this already. And I strongly believe that he will face justice for his crimes. So look, I, I ask you to continue to support brave people of Belarus, but uh, also, uh, of course, support Ukraine uh, because the fates of uh, Belarus uh, also depends on them. We understand that uh, we really believe in Belarus, we really believe that uh, Ukraine will be the winner uh, of this uh, cruel war and uh, it will give us one more like chance, one more chance, you know, to, to uh, get rid of Lukashenko. It would be uh, much easier because Lukashenko will feel uh, much more weaker than uh, he feels now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Svetlana, in Washington, people keep asking, uh, will Putin stop at, at Ukraine and Belarus? Does he want more? Does he want the Baltic states? Does he want Poland? What do you think about that question? I hear such talks that uh, in the case that something goes wrong and, uh, you know, I just even don't want to, to think about this that uh, uh, his aim, uh, uh, Putin's aim could be uh, European countries. And uh, of course, uh, we understand that uh, uh, all the European countries are in NATO, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, there are concern in, uh, in propaganda using this message about uh, nuclear weapon. And of course it scares the world. 
so it's very important using all the possible uh, means um, diplomacy uh, support to ukraine uh, to stop this uh, conflict to stop this uh, deaths uh, as soon as possible absolutely uh, how do belarusians feel about putin's threats to use uh, nuclear arms on ukraine and europe do you do you guys think that's serious or is is putin bluffing you know where um, uh, Russian troops concentrated on their borders with Ukraine and in Belarus, we also, Belarusians also didn't believe that the war could start because we thought it's done for uh, demoralization mm -hmm. of uh, Ukrainians, demoralization of, um, uh, of democratic allies. But now, I'm really afraid to say so, but now maybe everything is possible. I, yeah. I really don't know because when you are cornered and you want to keep your face, mm -hmm. uh, you don't think about people, you don't think about the world, you think only about how strong you are to show this strength to the world. So um, I wouldn't predict this, but uh, it's, uh, it could be our reality. I, yeah. I, I really don't know. What do you think about this? Another discussion we're having here is that Vladimir Putin has changed. The Vladimir Putin of 1999, when he came into power at the end of the year, uh, was very cautious. You know, he was sort of a gray bureaucrat. He'd been a spy. He'd been in Dresden. He was sort of a, a, a German Russian uh, and, and predictable. But the Putin that we see today is taking enormous risks. And, you know, he's betting his entire legacy uh, on, on this, uh, this war in, in Ukraine. Do you think he's changed? Do you think he's sick? Or do you think he's just paranoid from COVID? Look, I don't know what's going on in, in the head of uh, this person, but maybe when people are in power for so long time, you know, they have everything. They have power, they have uh, millions, uh, you know, they are looking for what else they can reach, how they are going to stay in the history. And this, um, uh, this intention to return all the countries into the family of Soviet mm -hmm. Union uh, became uh, like his goal at the moment. And it doesn't matter uh, how much it will cost. Yeah. So maybe this is the only explanation, but uh, maybe uh, uh, all the reasons you listed also make sense. Yeah, yeah. So, Lana, let's talk a little bit about the political prisoners that are in Belarus. So, there's more than a thousand political prisoners, is that right? Uh, according to, you know, officially recognized uh, by a humanitarian uh, center, uh, or Human Rights Defendant Center Visna, the number is 1,067 at the moment. Okay, okay. And your husband is, is one of them. Num yeah, actual number is, is much higher, of course. Okay, okay, great. So, but your husband is one of them and your political partner, uh, Maria Klesnikova, they're both political prisoners and still in jail today, right? That's right, yeah. And, and I, I'd love for you to tell our audience, so I, I think some of us are familiar with your husband's story. Uh, if you could just tell us a little bit more. He was he was a blogger, and what happened to him? How did he get drawn into politics? He bought, he bought a business, he bought a house, and then he ran into all kinds of government regulation. Is that the story? And, and then he said, I don't like this. Tell us about his story. How did he get pulled into politics? Yeah, my husband was a business businessman. First of all, he had his own production center, and he was shooting advertising and movies all over the world. But uh, once uh, he started to think about, uh, you know, about uh, our uh, pension times, I don't know. He decided to buy a, a house. You know, we, he was dreaming that we will sit there uh, with our children, like, you know, very, very cozy picture. But he faced um, so many obstacles that mm -hmm. couldn't um, uh, fulfill all his dreams. Mm -hmm. And he started to, you know, he also was, was it absolutely a political person? Mm -hmm. a, a, a political apolitical, uh-huh, apolitical, uh-huh. 
And, uh, but when he faced all these difficulties, you know, he started to dig deeper. Why is going on in our country? Why can't I can't as businessman, as citizen of my country to do uh, what I want? Uh, like it's, it's according to the law. I want to buy a house, you know, so uh, all these things. And we started to ask businessmen, he asked, he started to ask ordinary people what they think about the situation. And step by step, he became political blogger. He didn't have such intention. But for uh, about two years, uh, he gathered uh, a lot of viewers. He didn't just uh, he, uh, sit in one place, like communicating. He started to go from city to city, collecting people, asking them about their lives. And people were shocked uh, that he's such a strong, he's such uh, um, fearless, I would say, in, in, in this political uh, situation when uh, there is no freedom of speech, he dared uh, to uh, collect public opinion. And people, uh, more and more people started to come to him, consultate him. And at the end, people asked him, uh, would you be a candidate for um, uh, in, in presidential election? And he already was so involved in, in this, in this, uh, in this understanding uh, of poor management of our country that uh, he uh, agreed, but uh, preventively he was detained and uh, he lost this moment uh, of giving documents to Central Election Commission. And can you tell us about Maria? So Maria is about to turn 40. She's going to have a birthday next month, right? Your partner. So uh, for those of you who haven't been following Belarus super closely, uh, two, two years ago, Svetlana and Maria and one other lady became a trio and they ran around Belarus and they inspired the country and Svetlana um, ran against Lukashenko. But her partner uh, who's in prison, Maria Klesnikova is a flutist. She's very tall, very beautiful, white blonde hair. And it's her going to be her 40th birthday party uh, next month. And I think, Svetlana, that we should give her a birthday party, that our friends in, in California should give her a party, that your, uh, the Atlantic Council will give a party. I want to organize something in, in Germany where she was an artist for many years. And I hope that you all will organize something in Vilnius. But can you tell us a little bit more about Maria? Uh, we know that she's defiant. She's in prison and she just gave the most beautiful interview to the BBC. And she said, I hate running, but I'm going to run because it keeps me sane. And she's writing letters and reading newspapers. What else do you know about Maria? How is she doing? Uh, and how could we help her? Uh, you know, I uh, knew uh, Maria only since July 2020. Oh, wow. Before, okay. uh, we haven't known each other before. But she uh, was in the team of uh, Victor Babalika. Mm -hmm. And she was so devoted to this idea of new bureaus where uh, artists, musicians will feel free. You know, and she uh, was very brave. She is very brave. Just maybe some of our viewers, viewer, viewers don't know the situation when she uh, also wanted by KGB to, uh, was made to leave the country. She tore her passport, not let them do this. She preferred to stay uh, in Belarus and be jailed, but not to, um, uh, not to stop this fight. And it's uh, such, a, uh, such a courage that mm -hmm. it's sometimes mm -hmm. difficult to see even from men. We are on constant uh, communication with your sister uh, who mm -hmm. represents uh, Maria everywhere now. And my letters are not given to Maria. It's like uh, forbidden, uh, but we know everything about her. And uh, she now in, in jail, she, um, she's working in this jail. She's suing something, you know, but all, all the people who uh, surrounding her say that she's always smiling. Mm. She's, uh, uh, you know, communicating very openly with administrations. She's not scared. Everybody is afraid of her in jail. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. Please, please go ahead. I'm no, sorry. I, I'm just, I'm just wanted to say that it's a, um, an example of of uh, woman resistance. It's example of uh, a strong, strong uh, woman in Belarus. Absolutely. And and Svetlana, uh, tell us why did Alexander Lukashenko let you run for president? 
So you, you are a professional English teacher. You're a mom with two children uh, and you've never been political in your life. You're super smart, but you never intended to be a political leader. Why did he decide to let you run? Uh, there can be a lot of reasons, but the most important two are, is that Lukashenko lost uh, connection with Belarusian people. He didn't catch the mood that it's not about Tikhanovsky or Babalika, it's about Belarusian people who woke up. So, uh, and he was sure that nobody would never vote for a housewife without any political background. Uh, but again, he didn't expect such uprising of Belarusians. Uh, people believed not in me, like personally, because I honestly told that, look, I, I really sometimes don't, don't know what to do. I'm uh, the usual person as you are. They believed in, in changes. They believed in new Belarus. And because uh, all the other uh, strong candidates have been jailed or uh, made uh, you know, uh, to flee the country, uh, I was the only candidate uh, that could represent people. And people saw me, people uh, saw how uh, I, I, I didn't give up uh, when I was threatened uh, uh, during this pre-election campaign and uh, they uh, stood with me shoulder to shoulder. And, yeah. you know, Lukashenko couldn't prognose this. Yeah, yeah. He, he didn't think that uh, a woman would have any chance and he was, he was totally wrong. So you're right. It speaks to the power of, of Belarusian women and, and that symbol of you and Maria uh, and your, your colleague, uh, Veronica, last year or two years ago was just so beautiful. Is, is there anything else that you would like to tell us or any, anything else your friends in America need to know or, or any ways we can help you? You know, maybe it's like, I want to call for the end of war and I hope it will end with a victory of Ukraine. Uh, the Russian troops must leave our country immediately. Belarus must be free and sovereign country just as Ukraine now. And we only want to uh, freedom, the freedom to develop, to choose our leadership and to join the uh, community of nations in peace. Uh, the, in democratic countries don't attack each other. Uh, please uh, remember this and uh, maybe you know, I, I'm sure, uh, Belarusian people are sure that Ukrainians will win uh, because every day their morale is raising because Ukrainians are fighting for their homes, for their families, for their country, but Russians don't understand what they are fighting for. They think that they will be greeted with flowers in Ukraine, but instead they uh, met strong resistance and uh, unlike the Ukrainians, lose their morale every day because they are not ready to die in someone else's war to die in the war that one person launched. So I really believe in uh, our uh, peaceful future for both our, our countries. Fabulous. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. Uh, thank you for giving us so much of your time today. It was a great pleasure to see you. I'm glad to see you in good health, good spirits. We stand with you. And we would love to have you back at the Atlantic Council. I know that my friends at the World Affairs Council would love to have you back as well. Thank you. May God bless you. May God bless Belarus. And let's talk again very, very soon. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Melinda. And thank you, Svetlana. Um, we know that Svetlana has to, has to go. So um, I'm going to just enter into our Q&A uh, session right now, and we'll try to get to a, uh, we've got a, a number of, of questions, um, but I would love for either you, Melinda, or, or Julie to um, to address the questions as they come in. And the first one is, you know, something somewhat terrible to contemplate, but um, a good question. If, if Svetlana had been elected president, do you think that Belarus would have experienced the same fate as we're seeing with Ukraine today? Maybe, I think is the answer, Rick. Uh, Ukraine has a special resonance for Vladimir Putin, uh, Belarus a little bit less so. Um, I, you know, it, it, the Vladimir Putin that we're seeing today uh, has been pretty consistent on his message since he gave these very angry remarks at the Munich Security Conference back, back in the 2000s. Uh, and he has said Ukrainian identity is fake. 
Uh, he has said it's not a real language. He says my historic lands, Russia's historic lands sit in Ukraine. So he's got a big chip on his shoulder with Ukraine and he's wanted to destroy Ukraine uh, for a long, long time. Uh, he has a different relationship with Belarus uh, and they, the Belarusians and the Russians have been warm, cold, warm, cold and Lukashenko has played them very ably for years. Uh, so uh, I think my answer is maybe, but not necessarily. Thank you. Um, do we know anything about uh, the U.S. or other NATO countries supplying, uh, you know, either opposition forces in Ukraine or or Belarus with with any sort of drones? And this is sort of a technical question, um, but I think we all are seeing the convoy, the long convoy on the news, yeah. and 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 wondering if there can't be some sort of um, you know guerrilla terrorist you know type of attacks there. Um, but are there drones? And if have you heard of any attacks uh, on on those convoys? So there are drones. Um, they I don't know if the U.S. is supplying them. I do not have a security clearance, <laughs> and uh, I I don't uh, you know dabble in that world. Um, a lot of the drones are coming from Turkey, uh, and what I'm being told is that there are not enough pilots to to commandeer these drones. So I think very smart military planners. There's many of them here. There's many in Poland. Uh, you know, in allies and partner countries in NATO are trying to figure out what to do about that, what to do about that convoy, um, you know, but at this point, uh, you know, it looks like a sitting duck, uh, but the a sitting target, but the Ukrainians don't have a very large air force. Uh, and I'm sure the Ukrainians are coming up with all sorts of ways uh, to try to get rid of it. Um, you know, I think one of the, the surprising things to me is how poorly the Russians have done since last Thursday. Uh, you know, they're running out of fuel, they're running out of food. There's reports that their conscripts didn't know that they were going into Ukraine and they're horrified. Uh, so, you know, I think it shows uh, there were a lot of bad assumptions went into this war. Vladimir Putin thought he could just roll into Ukraine and that they would push President, President Zelensky out of the way. But if Vladimir Putin had read a newspaper uh, and seen the polling, so there's a, a great uh, public opinion center in Kiev called the Razumkov Center, and it says that 45% of Ukrainians will fight and defend their territory. That polling came out before uh, Putin went in. So I'm not sur surprised by the strength of the resistance whatsoever. Thank you. Hey, um, I, I think we've certainly heard it from Svetlana, but um, how strong are actually the, the family friend ties between Ukraine and Belarus? And, and do we think that if uh, Belarus becomes heavily involved, you know, with the attack on Ukraine, that, that there would be a severe backfire uh, in Minsk? Or is the, is the opposition and the, and the government uh, just, you know, opposition is such an, you know, in, in, in held, being held down by the government that that could not, cannot happen. Okay, so the opposition is in exile. You have to remember that. The opposition in Belarus has been in exile for, for years. And it's in four different places. It was in four different places, maybe five. It's mostly in Vilnius. That's where Tikhonovskaya's office is. They have a large office in Warsaw called the Coordination Council, and that's headed by Pavel Latushka. Uh, they have some people in Riga doing women's work. They have some people, they had a lot of people in, in Ukraine before the war started because it was very easy for people to, to get to Ukraine. Uh, when they were in danger, they could just get on a train and get there. Obviously, no one wants to be in Ukraine right now. And then as Svetlana said, there's also people in, in Georgia as well. But I think Svetlana did a good job of, of explaining that, yes, you know, on paper, uh, the regime there, Lukashenko and his, it's a security state. It's a very scary security state. They're behind uh, Putin. They will do what he says. Uh, but the people are not behind Lukashenko and they don't want to attack Ukrainians. So I, I, I would I would be very, very curious to see if there's any reliable numbers on what that split looks like. You know, for, for the last two years, since August 2020, when those uh, falsified elections happened in Belarus, we've all been watching to see, will there be splits in the security services? This is what political science geeks tell you to watch for uh, in these transition periods. And the, the, the splits in the security services were not deep enough. Not enough people defected uh, from the security services or from the police forces, uh, unfortunately, in Belarus in 2020 and 2021. We don't know what's going to happen now. And I think Svetlana is right that there's a new opportunity. You know, countries move in cycles. And when these countries are stuck in a, in a, a deep authoritarian pattern, uh, you know, th there are windows of opportunity, windows of change. And I think we may be seeing another one in Belarus right now. Just a, a follow up on that from my perspective. I wonder what the what the reception is uh, in Belarusian hospitals to what we see uh, being the ambulance uh, 
ambulances of Russian injured Russian soldiers? Yeah, I, that, that's a really good question, Rick. That you know, two days ago, I, I was. Uh, I was on the BBC and they asked me to look at all the newspapers in the world and five British newspapers chose that image that you're describing of the young the young girl dying at, in the back of the ambulance. Uh, and it's a gripping picture. Uh, and I, I don't think anyone wants, you know, wants to see that. And, and I, I don't think anyone, everyone is going to be affected by that image. Uh, I don't know about any stories uh, of, you know, hospital workers um, refusing to treat people or anything like that. But I, I think that those images really need to get out to the Russia, to, to Russia and to Belarus. Uh, and the US government needs to put a lot of money right now in a Russian language television station to communicate to Russians directly. We're not anti-Russian. Uh, we love the Russian people. We want you to realize uh, your, your dreams. We want uh, Russia to be a great uh, country where freedom is realized. And we have a problem with Putin, not, not a Russia problem. Yeah. yeah, I was referring to the pictures of actually of the the ambulances carrying injured Russian soldiers into Belarus. Oh, I'm sorry, I haven't seen those ones yet. I'm so sorry. Yeah, and so you know, sort of maybe an ethical dilemma for those uh, in in the hospitals working there. But of course, you want to treat treat your fellow human. Uh, well, I, I mean, doctors ethically have to treat whoever comes in, right? So, you know, that 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 that's the Hippocratic oath. So, I, I mean, I'm sure that they feel conflicted, but uh, you know, if you're a doctor, that's what you do. And you, another question, can you comment on the censorship of news across all channels that, that Belarusians receiving regarding not only uh, you know, Ukraine uh, and, and the activity there, but, but about just the government as well? Is it as, you know, as, as suppressive as the Soviet state today? I, I don't know if it's as suppressive as the Soviet state. I think you should ask uh, Svetlana that question or a Belarusian, uh, but it's terrible. Uh, and th basically, there's no independent media left on the ground in in Minsk. Uh, Voice uh, Voice of America, or sorry, Radio Free Europe, has an amazing service, uh, but they're they're based in, in Prague. They, I think they do have some stringers left on the ground, but it's extremely dangerous. Uh, you know, people have gone to online uh, systems using Nexta uh, and using uh, social media to talk, um, and it's it's very very hard to get real information. Thank you. Um, how about a, a comment generally? Um, the question is on on participation of women in, in politics generally. And and I've got to say, it's so impressive to see the three of you here on screen today. But um, and this question is, is addressed to Savetlana, but perhaps to you. How do how do you view the participation of, of women in politics, politics, especially in areas such as uh, the African countries as well, who are under authoritarian regimes? I, I, I'm going to channel Svetlana here. I don't think she'll mind. Uh, I, you know, I, I think that uh, women have a, a and, and I'm a mother too, women have a responsibility and we feel it keenly uh, because we have children. Uh, and I, I don't think Svetlana ever wanted to be involved in political life. That's not who she is. I've gotten to know her. I've, I've been very fortunate to get to know her. Uh, and she wants to raise her children and have a peaceful life. Uh, and she's eager to get back to that. But she uh, didn't have a choice. You know, her husband went to jail, and uh, she had to step up, and she had to to try to fill his shoes, and she's done it very brilliantly. Uh, but I think, just in general, uh, women feel a keen sense of responsibility, uh, especially especially since uh, you know, especially for uh, women who are mothers. I say that as a mother. Thank you. Do Do you think that um, that the opposition can realistically rid Belarus of the current president of Lukashenko's regi regime? I don't know. The The opposition is pretty weak. And I say this analytically, they don't like it when I say that, but I think we need to be honest. Uh, but there is a new opportunity given what's happening in Ukraine now. It's it's really TBD. We have to see what Putin does next. And right now he's, uh, you know, he's engaging in indiscriminate bombing. So the question is, what is the West going to do? Can the West stop him? And so far, we haven't been able to do that. I think she made an incredible observation, um, which I agree with, that you know dictators cannot be re-educated or yeah. appeased. So we'll have to see how the West responds. Um, a good question here: um, Is it appropriate for for us, for the to the world, for the world to refer to Svetlana as the opposition leader when, in fact, she won the election last year? Well, look, uh, we don't have you know we we have. Uh, the math is fuzzy on this. We know Lukashenko did not win 
Uh, we didn't have, uh, you know, Belarus is a repressive place. Uh, we, we would have had to have election monitors on the ground and, and you know, count ballots. And it's a, it's a technical process to be able to say, you know, with 100% certainty, she won 60 to 40 or whatever the split was. We still don't know. We know that she won, he lost. Uh, I have no problem. I, I call her the democratic leader of Belarus. Um, you know, she's she is the legitimate leader of Belarus. And I, I think that's uh, how everyone refers to her. Thank you. L last question uh, before we close. Um, uh, how strong is uh, the opposition movement in Belarus? And, and, the, and the perspective is with Russia having now a, such a greater, you know, proactive presence in Belarus uh, against Ukraine, does that help or hurt the opposition movement at this point? I think it actually helps the opposition movement. So here's here's a, a bit more that we need to say. Uh, the most capable and energetic and, and educated and enterprising Belarusians have gone abroad. So if you were involved in the democratic movement in 2020 and 2021, you're probably living abroad because it's dangerous for you to be in Belarus. So the you know the people who were most anti Lukashenko are all gone. It's several hundred thousand people, and they're spread out all over Europe. Some are in the United States and some are in Australia. They're, they're everywhere. Uh, you know, so the people who are remaining in uh, Bel Belarus are either apathetic uh, or they're pro Lukashenko. And then there's a silent group of people who don't like him, but who are too afraid to speak out. But Aksa, or, uh, Svetlana just spoke about this new movement of people who are coming out, who are resisting. So I, I think, uh, you know, the, the, what Putin is doing now is going to give uh, encouragement to all those silent resistors. Uh, and I think it may spark another wave of protests. Great, thank you. Well, we've, we've near the end of our hour here, just giving a couple of minutes for, for close. Um, so I, I wanna thank certainly Svetlana in, in absentia, um, Melinda, yourself, and, and Ambassador Fisher for what a great program today. I mean, this is so insightful, insightful and gives everybody such great perspective on, on what such a you know, historic, historic time. Um, and thanks to our audience as well uh, for being with us. Um, it's these types of programs uh, which provide real world insight into global issues and the personal experiences and perspectives of those involved that really help um, the World Affairs Council of Orange County bring value and, and truth uh, uh, and, and, and knowledge to our Southern California uh, community. Um, speaking of that, um, and to help us continue to provide quality programming at, at nominal cost, please donate to support our mission. As you might imagine, there's a, a donate button on our website and we encourage you to make liberal use of that. And we're ever uh, grateful for your, for your generosity. Um, and of special interest to some of you might be an upcoming event this uh, weekend called Academic World Quest, um, in which uh, local high schools will compete for a chance to go to Washington, D.C. for the finals um, in, a, in a program oriented around educating and, and, and challenging them on, on world affairs. Um, we also have a great uh, slate of programs scheduled coming up, which you can view on our website and include uh, uh, Secretary Leon Panetta speaking to the challenges of leadership in our democracy and a, and a number of others um, uh, focused uh, both on national security issues, uh, China's uh, persecution of the Uyghurs and, and regional events as well. So please uh, uh, visit our website. We appreciate your participation today. Thank you to all of our panelists and have a great day and weekend. Thank you.